Hello, everyone, and welcome to Book Break for the Greece Public Library. I'm Claire. I'm a librarian here. I lead two book clubs, and today I am joined by my coworker Jenna. Hello. How's it going? Good. Good. So Jenna convinced me to do an episode about cozy fantasy. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it really broadens your horizons, doesn't it? <laughs> In like the most comfortable way. It does. I actually was pleasantly surprised because I think every book I read, I liked, and I would definitely read more of this. That's like, I want to read more. I know. So you got me to read T.J. Klune, and look what happens, I'm Jenna. I'm so glad. I know. It's so, a gateway drug. So what is cozy fantasy for those of you that don't know? It's, I think it's kind of about a feeling. Um, yeah, it's like a hug. Yes. It's like a brain hug. A brain hug. It's something that you do while wrapped up in a nice quilt and a cup of tea or yes. coffee. Yeah. With by a, a fire. Somewhere. Yeah. I like it. We need flames. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of the elements in a cozy fantasy would be good hearted characters, supportive friends, uh, magic, right? Magic. Um, found family. That's another. That's a good one. That's a big one, I think. At least in a couple that I've read. Yeah, some world building in there. Nothing too like Tolkien. Right. Okay. Just slight. Yeah. So let's get ready. Um, I will start us off with the first one. The first one I read is called A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. Um, I'm so excited to hear about this. One. Yes, it's by T. Kingfisher, who is actually a woman named Ursula Vernon, who lives in North Carolina. That's an who knew? That's you know? an amazing name. Yes, but she's won like a Hugo and a Nebula Award, like a lot of fantasy or sci-fi awards. Um, this book, I think, was published as a YA book, but it's okay. on a lot of lists for adults that like this genre. Um, so my character is 14-year-old Mona. Mona. She's a wizard, and her magic only works on bread. <laughs> so her biggest achievement to date has been an enormous sourdough starter named Bob, who is pretty much Amazing. taking over the bakery basement. This is very COVID pandemic yes. time. Yeah. And um, she also can make the gingerbread men in her bakery dance. So to kind of entertain the, the patrons. So. You know what's cool is that I can make bakery items disappear. <laughs> oh, oh, that's real magic. <laughs> but um, so anyway, one morning, Mona goes into her aunt's bakery at 4 a.m. to start her day, and there's a dead body on the floor. Crisis. Yeah. So this is kind of what starts our story. Um, so she's questioned by police. She's actually taken into the palace, and she learns that there is a person who is hunting down magical folk. So Mona could be next on the list. Um so what happens is she meets a lot of side characters. First of all, she meets Spindle, who I believe is the the deceased brother. Um, she has another friend named Knackering Molly, mm -hmm. who can make like dead horses walk. <laughs> so I don't know what to say to that one. I I know, but um, she's pretty funny actually. But um. Mona, the interesting thing that was funny about this one is she really doesn't want to be a hero. She is like being dragged, kicked, and screaming to save the kingdom. Sure. Um, because she doesn't really think she's like she's like I'm not a powerful wizard. You know, she I just can wants make to make bread. Yeah, I can make good bread. I I can make you a cinnamon roll, but you know, save the kingdom. I don't know. So she ends up having to use her talent to save against these invaders that are coming and also save the queen or whatever of the kingdom. So it's a, it's, it was actually, it was very funny. It's, it's definitely cozy. Uh, it's laughable. Some of the characters are cute. I wouldn't say this is like high adventure or suspense. Sure. There's no like high stakes. Well, well that's I guess. The point. Yeah. But that's the whole point. Yeah. So, and Bob is definitely a scene stealer. She uses Bob in a variety of ways as, really? as like a weapon. So, yeah. So that was one of the best parts. I would cool. say if you liked Sh Shrek. Um, it did give Shrek vibes. Yeah. The description. It definitely, it definitely does. Um, so was it, is it human world and magic world combined? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the magical people... Almost sounds like they're they have to register and like people know who they are, but they live amongst the human world. Yeah, so 
Interesting. Cool. But that was that was my first one. That sounds very cozy. Yes. Is it funny? Yes. Great. Yeah. I Parts like of that. it, I think I listened to it and then I, I got the book because listening to it, like some of her hesitancy about being oh, well, a like hero start delivery. to get on my nerves. Okay. <laughs> like, okay, enough already. You either get, get in the shoes of the hero or you don't, you know. But um, you know, once I read it, I read it pretty fast. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What's your first one for us? My first one is actually kind of a darker, cozy fantasy, so I'm we're opposite ends of the spectrum here. My first one is um, The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. She wrote The Night Circus. I love that one. arguably her more, more popular book, but this one kind of was more of um, more mind games, I guess. Okay. So this is not the most glowing description, but it took me probably half of the book to get into it. And then once I got to that halfway point, I stayed up until like 2 a.m. to read the entire second half. So if you can trudge through the first half of very confusing mind stuff, you'll get to the amazing second half and it'll be wonderful. So our main character is Zachary Rollins. He's a graduate student in Vermont. And he's in the library doing some research, looking for some books. And he finds this mysterious looking misplaced leather book okay. okay, in the library. Modern day. We're modern day humans here. And he takes it home. He checks it out. There's no ISBN. There's nothing to scan it out. And the librarian does not know where it came from. She's like, just take it and bring it back next time you come. So he takes it home. He sits down to read it. And he's reading it. It's a, a magical story about princesses and pirates and all this fun stuff. And he just assumes it's a fairy tale story. But as he's reading it, the story changes into a story that he experienced as a kid. Oh. So he's reading his real life memory in this book. And he's like, what? How did this book author get my exact experience? And of course, it's very scary. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, all of these mysterious things start to happen. So he starts to get an invitation from a masquerade ball club, which he goes to, and there's little symbols on it that he has to follow, kind of like a mystery in a way. Okay. Um, and he meets people along the way that become his friend. Um, and at the masquerade club, he ends up going underground into a hidden library. It's really fascinating. It's very hard to explain without um, sounding crazy because there's lots of twisty turns in here. Yeah, but you had me at Hidden Library. It's so. a hidden library, and it's underground, and it's amazing, and there's no one there, and he's like, well, what the heck am I doing here? Yeah. So he's basically discovering this whole wonderful world, but also his purpose along the way, which is the best hero journey that you can have, really. Um, there's also some love, some LGBTQ love representation in here. Okay. Very slight. Um, but it's kind of like... The best way I can explain this book is when I was reading it, it really sucked me in the second half. And a lot of times when I read a book, I think about the book right after I finish it. And I mm -hmm. think, oh, I missed that world a lot. That was really good. I wish I could experience that again. And then I kind of put it aside and I keep reading the next book. But this book is constantly in the back of my head thinking about it. Every book I read, I think about this book. It's just amazing. Wow. It really sticks with you in the back of your head, but you really kind of have to go through it to get it. I'm definitely going to add this one yeah. to my list. I love The Night Circus. It's amazing. And that one had a good romance in there. Or it does. Yeah. This one is a little bit less romance. Okay. Um, but it's the same. It's a similar, like, you find yourself in The Night Circus thinking, what is going on? Where are we? What time period are we in? And then all of a sudden at the end, it just weaves perfectly together. And it's yeah. so magical feeling. Okay. Yeah. Mm, that's definitely a good one. That's a good one. So my next one, it, it's like if you do a search about cozy fantasy on either Reddit or anywhere, book lists, you're going to come up with this next title, which is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. I've um, heard so much about this one. Yeah, the, the quote from the internet is, if Dungeons and Dragons had a baby with Animal Crossing, you would get the absolute <laughs> delight that is Legends and Lattes. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty darn funny. Um, I listened to this one on audio because literally there's like a hold list and I had to wait a while to get it. We had this discussion. Yes, yes. we actually have prompted both the fiction buyer and, and the, and the uh, overdrive people, people to, to get this book, which they do. Um, but it it's a lot of fun characters. The main character is Viv, who is an orc. Um, and I kind of picture her, and that was the thing about reading it, I mean, listening to it mm -hmm. too, you kind of, you picture everything. So I pictured this big mercenary, like, 
was she green? I thought so. Okay. I, I think green would be good. Um, and she has a sword named Black Blood. Ooh. So Intimidating. she is tired of her life. She is over being a mercenary, soldier, killer, etc. And she has a dream of settling down and opening a coffee shop. Because she all. happened to visit a coffee shop that was run by gnomes in one of the cities where she's had a conquest. So... Um, she saves her gold and coins, and actually one of the last people that she killed was a magical being that had a stone, I believe, in her forehead that has properties where if you get this stone, you're supposed to have like good luck and success and all these things. So she divvies up all the spoils with the rest of her crew. She takes the stone and then high, hightails it out of there. So Solid. she leads herself to a town called Thune. She finds a building. It was like an old stable. It's dilapidated. It's not in good shape. But she thinks, you know, this is the place is where I am, place. I'm going to be. And um, gradually she starts making friends. The first person she comes across is a little gnome. And he is like helping her construct everything. And they design everything. And then she has um, another friend called... Thimble, who comes in a lot, like once she opens her shop, and he doesn't really talk much, but he bakes. So then she begins okay. carrying baked goods in the in the shop, and That's they're amazing. renamed. It's, it's like, you know, cinnamon rolls, but then, like, I picture little biscotti, and they call them something funny and, you know, some other things. Um, and then she has another... Um, partner her name is tandry and this one also has kind of a light romance mm -hmm. but it's L lgbtq um nothing like explicit or anything kind of reminded me of a tj clune sure. book but um so and then they have a big cat that happens in who i picture this big like mountain forest cat that mm -hmm. kind of scares everyone but they only once the their business is successful and everything. They're visited by like an unsavory element in the town, kind of like a mafia type thing. Oh no. And they want protection payments for oh. her successful business. Um, and she, Viv does not want to do that. And then one of her former like coworkers in her other life discovers that she took that stone and he wants it. I forgot about the stone. Yes. He kind of thinks that the whole reason she's been successful is because she took this stone and sure. she has she's buried it on her property. So, you know, and her business has taken, you know, it's taken off. Like, people love it. Even though no one in this town even knew what coffee was, <laughs> she gave out free samples and now they all love it. And it's kind of like a community hub. Like, people just start coming. Like, they have a young person that does music and so it kind of becomes a coffee house and okay yeah it's a lot of fun but um the thing is is the whole message is you can rewrite your story like Viv was a mercenary but she really wanted to be something else and of course you know there's a feel-good lesson involved like they do have some bad things happen I don't want to spoil the story for anyone yeah but good things come out of it, and it ends on a hopeful note. You're happy at the end. Oh, yeah. And you realize that Viv has really made friends and has made a mark in this community. So I wish that he would write another book about these characters. I like them so yeah, much. Really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love that feeling. Yeah. It's like a bittersweet feeling. Yeah. It's You're like so the... happy to know those characters, but so sad to see them go. Right. I so. Know. Okay. I got my... My main man, TJ Klune, here okay. to discuss. Um, I picked Under the Whispering Door because you've read Cerulean Sea. Most of the world feels like has read Cerulean Sea. And Under the Whispering Door did not get as much love, I don't think. Um, which is a little sad because I think it was a little bit more... Um, it was deeper. It was mm -hmm. more profound feeling. So Under the Whispering Door starts with Wallace Price. He's a 40-year-old lawyer, and he's just the biggest jerk 
ever. Very Scrooge, okay? Very like, you don't get any money, I'm going to fire you, I don't like you, I hate all my ex-wives, that type of situation, okay? Okay. And he's in his office, he's firing his current secretary who has a whole list of her own personal problems and crying, and he sends her out into the world, and he has heartburn, and he thinks, oh, I shouldn't have had that chili for lunch, right? Um, little does he know, in less than a day, he was dead from a heart attack, and he wakes up and can see his body dead on his office floor. Uh Uh-oh. And he's like, oh, crap, am I dead, you know? (laughs) Um, And the next thing he knows, he's getting wished away to his funeral, and he's in the back of the church, and he can see his dead body in his casket. Um, And the people that are there are his three partners and his law attorney and his ex-wife. No one's crying. The three law attorneys that are there that are his partners are talking about how much they hated him. His ex-wife is just ready to get the show on the road so she can get out of there. And he's like, well, no one's mourning me. What is with that? And he looks over and he sees someone he doesn't know in the pew named May. She can see him. She makes eye contact with him and starts talking to him. And she... is his spirit guide into the next life. So kind of like Dickens, like a... A little bit Dickens. Okay. A little bit, now that I say that. A Christmas Carol. Like Christmas Carol really triggers that for you. So he doesn't really care that he's dead. He's, He's more so mad that he can't pursue his law degree and career anymore. Um, but he meets May and she starts shuttling him towards his ferryman, which is the person that will bring him from his purgatory state to his forever afterlife. But his name is Hugo, the ferryman, and he lives in this beautiful treehouse tea shop building okay so the way tj clune describes it is so magical it's just like the coziest little tree house that also serves tea and baked goods to the public he's a human and like in the real life world the ferryman um, is human the ferryman is human okay and like alive with the living and he assists he um wallace and other spirits through to the afterlife so wallace Kicking and screaming gets dragged to see Hugo. And once he sees Hugo, he gets this big yellow golden cable that comes out of his chest and hooks onto Hugo's chest. It's like a light cable. Okay. So they are now attached and they can't separate. Um, They can, you know, there's some distance. They can wander around. Um, But when they're in the home, they are off the hook. Okay. So anywhere outside of the home. Most of the book takes place in the home. Um, there are other spirits there. Wallace's grandparent is there. There's a spirit dog, which is particularly amazing. Um, and so Wallace really struggles with being a spirit. And he, he knows he has to figure something out to move on to his afterlife. But mostly he's just trying to figure out how he can go back to being alive. Okay. So he's learning lessons along the way. He maybe falls in love with a certain character that I will not spoil. Um, and you really just learn it's... It deals a lot with death, which I, at first, was very, like, not for me. I don't want to read about death. I don't want to think about it. And there are some heavy moments in it and heavy quotes that T.J. Klune talks about death and, and grieving. But it's in such a cozy, warm hug type of way that it's not scary or shocking or affronting to think about that situation. Okay. Yeah. That sounds really good. It is really good. Okay. Now I have to add another one to my list. You know, that's the whole point this of this podcast. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but not for me, Jenna. My to-be-read <laughs> list is already too long. So, What's all right. your last one? My last one is, I believe you recommended this one. I did. Uh, the Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches mm-hmm. by Sangu Mandana. Um, this one had a little bit of everything in it. It really does. It has diversity. It has romance. It has suspense. It has danger. Um, I really, really liked this one. So our main character is a witch named Mika Moon. And what I found interesting is at the beginning, there's like the little grouping of, of witches, but they're Come not in. allowed to get together very right. often. It's and secret. the the premise of this book is like once a witch is born, her parents would die and she would become an orphan. Yes. And then she's raised by another witch who really doesn't want to spend too much time together because 
they don't want to draw attention to their They don't witchiness. want to draw attention to themselves. And they also, when witches get together, it's like the magic, magic. multiplies. Magic. Yeah. So then it's even more likely to draw attention to them. Right. Um, so just for their own protection, this is how they're choosing to live. Well, Mika is lonely. She's, you know, been an orphan. She spent a lot of time, like, feeling like she didn't fit in. And one thing she wants to do is she decides she's going to post videos online <laughs> pretending that she's a witch. Yeah, she's going to be an influencer. Right. She's like a witch influencer, yeah. but thinks she's being fake. Well, keeping it very low key. <laughs> someone recognizes her as a, a true witch. So they message her and ask her to come to a, a kind of a mysterious house and train these three young witches that are there, um, which they shouldn't be there, you know, because right. they're three they're all together. witches together. And there's also kind of an unusual cast of characters. There's uh, a gardener there. There's a teacher there. And who else is there? I'm trying to think. Um, oh, Cook. Um, yes, the couples that own it. Yeah. It's very much uh, the house and by the Cerulean Seed type of all these characters that you wouldn't expect to be together are together in one house. Right. It's very much a found family story. Yes. Like they, n none of them have had a particularly great life anywhere else, but they're having a really great life together. There's a librarian. Yes. How can we forget? That's right. <laughs> well, the librarian teacher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she decides, you know, to embark on this challenge. She has like two weeks to prove herself as a suitable teacher. And one of the girls hates her <laughs> and is attempting to like put a kibosh on this whole thing. But of course, you know, she wins her over and and then they find out like there's a, an attorney. The bad thing is an attorney is going to come and decide like how to administer the house at this whole situation. Yeah. And they're terrified of the magic spilling out because these three young girls have not been able to control their magic. Yes. And that is what Mina is supposed to be teaching them how to do. Yes. So, um, yeah, but it was good dialogue. It was funny at times. Mm -hmm. I liked the romance a lot. It was just really entertaining and just a feel good story. So. This is why I love cozy fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. It's uplifting. It It is. Yeah. Sometimes there's a challenge and you're like, oh, yeah, man, I hope they get out of this challenge. And you know what? They almost always do. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike great. Unlike the, the other kinds of book and cozy <laughs> fantasy, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed of a happy ending. I love so. that. Okay. So I'm sticking with the witchy theme. Okay. My last book is kind of, it's a series. It's two books. So it's The X-Hex and the Kiss Curse by Aaron Sterling. Um, I read these. Actually, I listened to them on audiobook right around September, October. So it was the perfect time to listen to these. Mm -hmm. Very witchy, very Halloween-y. Um, so do, do you, have you watched the Gilmore Girls? Some of them. Not okay. Uh, yeah, okay. That's the vibe. Oh. All right. Okay. Very small town, comforting, very like female-centric goodness yeah okay i rewatch gilmore girls every year in the fall it's just a comfort show for me this is a similar situation it's like a comfort book it is very much a romance very heavy on the romance that is the entire plot spicy romance or tame romance it can get spicy okay you know like i'd say like one pepper <laughs> all right <laughs> one chili pepper here okay. so so the story at least um the x-hex is the first one it deals with vivian or vivi um and nine years in the past before this book starts there's kind of a little flashback she is in college and she meets someone um his name I, i'm trying to get in all my main characters mixed up his name is reese penhallow he happens to be the son of the college's founding family all right so he's like ancient witch family hoity-toity okay. and she's like <laughs> doesn't really have that much of an air you know she's just a witch she's just there she's having fun so they meet in witch college um and they fall madly in love of course and he's only there for a semester and he ends up leaving to do family business and breaks her heart in the process oh no okay so Flash forward nine years, she is now a teacher at this college. She works there. She loves it there. And guess who shows up? 
Reese. Yes, because the town is a, has a magic population and a non-magic population. They're very separated. Mm-hmm. They don't like them to know. And the magic part of the town that's keeping the witches there and which is coming to that town is a tourism kind of for witches. Um, that magic is running out. And Uh-oh. the only person that can fix that is Reese Penhallow, who is the founder of the town. <laughs> so they meet. And, of course, all of the hilarity that ensues of that. Um, And they basically have to fix the magic together. And, of course, there's some love. Of course. You know, it's the people we find along the way (laughs) that really counts for the journey. Um, And The Kiss Curse is the sequel, but it deals with Vivian's cousin Gwen, who I found to be, like, a little bit more likable and funny as a narrator, um, and Reese's Penhallow's brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm Keeping gonna... it all in the family. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, it's great. It's cozy. The witches, they run um, a Halloween shop. Oh. Very, <laughs> with magical items in that, very big air quotes, um, that are actually magical, but it seems not magical to the regular human population. And they may or may not have a talking cat, who was a hilarious side character. Well, that, that that sounds awesome. You know what? Anytime you have a talking animal, it's like uh, when I read M- Remarkably Bright Creatures, it was the octopus that really <laughs> sold that story for me. Just if you want me to read it, say there's a talking animal in it. Yeah. Nine times out of ten. Sounds it's on good. my list. So, all right. Well, I... I can't thank you enough for introducing me to Cozy Fantasy. Oh, you're so very we want to know if you've read any Cozy Fantasy, if there's any of these books that you want to read. Um, thank what you so much. What we should read? Yes, what we should read if you have I love more, some recs. more, uh, more recommendations for us. But thank you so much for joining me, you're Jenna. Welcome. Thank it's you been for fun. having me. Now you'll have to get me to read something else, and we'll do another podcast I got nothing for you, Claire. <laughs> We can do it with the literature canon. Oh. (laughs) All right. So you can subscribe to our book break. You can find us right on our webpage. Um, We encourage you to follow us. And thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed 